Well, if you have your copy of God's Word, I would invite you to turn with me to the book of Psalms. Psalm 73 will be our text for this morning. And if you're using one of the Bibles provided, you can find it on page 534. On November 13th, 1789, Benjamin Franklin wrote to a French scientist named Jean-Baptiste Leroy. Franklin was concerned because he hadn't heard from his friend since the start of the French Revolution. And in that letter, uh, Benjamin Franklin gave a brief update on how things were going in the United States. He said, quote, Our new constitution is now established. Everything seems to promise it will be durable. But in this world, nothing is certain except death and taxes. Nothing is certain except death and taxes has become a fairly popular saying in American culture today. Or you may be thinking of more things that are certain. Hot Texas summers. Unfortunate Dallas Cowboys football seasons. <laughs> there are things that are going to happen that you can be certain of. And the Christian life is full of these things. Whether it be suffering and trials, everlasting life in Christ, heavenly rewards. Christian life is full of certainties. And in our passage this morning, we see that the psalmist Asaph points out two certainties. One for the unbeliever and one for the believer. So let's read our passage now, Psalm 73, beginning in verse 1. A psalm of Asaph. Truly, God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For they have no pangs until death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. They are not in trouble as others are. They are not stricken like the rest of mankind. Therefore, pride is their necklace. Violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes swell out through fatness. Their hearts overflow with follies. They scoff and speak with malice. Loftily they threaten oppression. They set their mouths against the heavens, and their tongue struts through the earth. Therefore his people turn back to them and find no fault in them. And they say, How can God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the wicked, always at ease. They increase in riches. All in vain have I kept my heart clean, and washed my hands in innocence. For all the day long I have been stricken and rebuked every morning. If I had said, I will speak thus, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I discerned their end. Truly, you set them in slippery places. You make them fall to ruin, how they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors, like a dream when one awakes. O oh Lord, when you rouse yourself, you despise them as phantoms. When my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast towards you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you, you hold my right hand, you guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For behold, those who are far from you shall perish. You shall put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of your works. There are two certainties that I want to focus on throughout this text. And if you're a note taker, this is my outline. You can be certain that one, the wicked will not prosper, and two, God will prosper his own. Let's look now uh, at verse verses 1 through 22, 
which is the first point, the wicked will not prosper. And then we can look at verses 23 through 28, God will prosper his own. This psalm is an interesting one because the psalmist Asaph compares the prosperity of the wicked with that of the righteous. In verse 1, he says that God is good to Israel, specifically to those who are pure in heart or to those who obey the covenant they are in with God. But in verse 2, Asaph shifts a little bit. He looks at his own life and his own situation. Why does, why does he do this? Well, verse 3, I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Asaph has taken his eyes off of God and has put them on the world around him. And it causes him to question his own faith. This language that's used in verse 2, my feet had almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped, describe a person who is on shaky ground with their faith. Their walk with the Lord, so to speak, is rocky. Things aren't going well for Asaph spiritually. He's struggling. And we see this, this stark contrast between verses 1 and 2. In verse 1, Asaph is looking at God. He's looking vertically. He's looking upward. And he says, God is good to Israel. God is good. He's, he's, he's faithful. He's pure. He's righteous. He's compassionate. He's loving. He's gracious. He's merciful. What, on and on and on. There's, there's so many things we could say about God. There's this brief meditation on who God is, and then Asaph drops his eyes. And he looks horizontal rather than vertical. The Lord is good to his children, he says. But as for me, but as for me, Asaph, you can, you can hear his gears turning. Am I, am I a child of God? Am I, am I one of his own? Can I expect to partake in the goodness of God? The answer is yes, of course, if, if Asaph's one of God's own. But notice why Asaph doubts. He doubts because of external actions, because of things that are going on around him. Metaphorically, his feet had nearly slipped because literally he'd taken his eyes off God. And he's put them on the things of the world. He's put them on other things. He takes his eyes off of God and he puts them on the wicked. And he sees what's going on with the wicked. They're prospering. They're doing well. These, these haters of God, these mockers, these, these people who say, like in verse 11, how can God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? These people mock God, and they hate God, and you would think God would bring down fire and brimstone like he did on Sodom and Gomorrah, right? But that's not what happens, at least not yet. Brothers and sisters, this is so often where doubting begins. There's, there's this intimate connection between our thoughts and our actions, between our head or heart and our conduct, and when we begin to doubt God, oftentimes it's because we're stuck in some cycle of sin. That's why we need to be watchful. We need to be on guard against the sins that so easily entangle us. We need to be aware of sinful patterns we might fall into because so often the conduct of our lives displays what we think about God. And this is, this is why we need the local church. Think about, think about when God asks Cain where, where Abel is in Genesis 4. And Cain says, I don't know, am I my brother's keeper? Yes! If you are, if you are a member of a ch this church, you are spiritually responsible for one another. You, you are supposed to exercise this, this care, this watchfulness over each other and admonish each other and encourage each other as, as occasion may require. You're called to be on guard against patterns of sin that others might fall into. You are responsible for the well-being of others. So when you see members of your church drop their eyes and look at the world and they stop looking at God, go and, and help them lift their head up back up to Christ. These wicked people, as verses 4 through 12 tell us, don't even care about death. They don't care about the direction of their lives. They don't care that they're sinners. They aren't concerned with the well-being of others. They aren't concerned with eternal matters. They're only concerned with the here and now. These wicked live, live carefree lives of just arrogant wickedness. Do you care about eternity? 
Do, do you think about where you'll spend eternity? It's a tough question. Maybe it's one we don't often think about. But if you're here this morning and you're struggling with doubt, I want to briefly encourage you. The fact that you care about eternity, even just a little bit, is if, if, you are, if you are a Christian and you're struggling with doubt and you care about eternity, you care about the things of God, you care about killing your sin, these are all evidences that, that God is at work within you. You're, it's evidence that you're not living a life like the wicked people described in verses 4 through 12. If you doubt that you're saved, look to Jesus. Don't look at your sin to get your assurance. Don't look at yourself. Look to Christ and to his finished work on the cross. Not every Christian doubts. Some Christians doubt more than others. Jude 22 tells us to be, to be merciful to those who are doubting. And there will be doubters, but when we doubt, we cannot look at our circumstances or at our own actions. We have to look to God. We have to look to, what, to the cross and to what Christ has done for his bride. This language that Asaph uses is classic Old Testament language to describe prosperity. It may seem weird to us, but this is how it was back then. This is how they, they t- spoke about things. You might think of this section, verses 4 through 12, as, as Asaph's way of saying, these people are as happy as a pig in the mud, or, or they've got more money than sense, or they're too big for their britches. Asaph says that their, their eyes swell out through fatness. It's an Old Testament way of saying that they're, they're doing really well. They're super wealthy. They're prosperous. Their tongue struts through the earth. They're super prideful. They're not in trouble or stricken like the rest of mankind. They've got no cares in life. These wicked people that Asaph sees are full of arrogance. Pride is their necklace, he says. And this pride leads them to scoff and speak with malice. They loftily threaten oppression. They, they think that they can claim whatever they want. And they'll threaten anyone who stands in their way. They reach the height of their arrogance in verse 11. How can God know? How can God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? They think, they think that, that God doesn't even know what's going on. And verse 12 is a nice summary of this whole section. Always at ease... Increasing in riches. Asaph then turns and looks at his own life in verses 13 through 16. He says, following God is just, it's vain. If this is how the wicked are being treated. Asaph is over here struggling, his feet slipping and stumbling. He's, He's afflicted. He's at the end of himself. And he says, is following God even worth it? What's the value of holiness when when I'm being paid with affliction? How is it that I desire to be holy in a world that that hates it? Asaph is is envious of the wicked and is pondering if following God is even worth it. He tries to think of how this, this reality could be so. How could God prosper the wicked and afflict his own? He's struggling with the problem of evil. He'd say, he says, when, he, when he's thinking about this, he says, it's a wearisome task. It's difficult. It's hard. His reasoning could only get him so far. Commenting on this, this passage, Charles Spurgeon said, quote, Asaph was a seer, but he could not see when reason left him in the dark. Even seers must have the sunlight of revealed truth to see by, or they grope like the blind. Asaph needed truth from God to figure this question out. He couldn't rely on his own strength or his own reasoning. He needed the light of God. Do we do that? When, when, when life presents tough questions, is your first instinct to go to Scripture? What, is, what does God have to say about this? How do, we, how do we respond when tragedy, 
when, when tragedy strikes? How do we sort out a world that's confusing and, and is confused and seems upside down? How do we make sense of evil in a world that God made as good? Does God even care at all? Can he do anything about it? These kinds of questions have answers in Scripture. And the more time you spend there, the more you'll understand the things and the ways that God does things. Asaph is about at the end of himself. He hasn't figured out why the wicked are prospering. That is, until he goes into the sanctuary of God. Only then did he discern their end. Asaph sought God's help to answer this question. He entered into the presence of God. His mind entered the place where God dwells. He shifts his point of view. When Asaph does this, his perspective on life changes drastically. He sees it from God's perspective and not from his own. He says that the end of the wicked, verse 18, the end of the wicked is this. Truly, you have set them in slippery places. You make them fall to ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors, like a dream when one awakes. O Lord, you, when you rouse yourself, you despise them as phantoms. God is the one who raises these wicked up to throw them down. He sets them in slippery places. They have, they have much earthly good, which is no good at all. If earthly good were of much value, God would not give so much of it to those who have so little of his love. While the wicked prosper for a moment, their sorrows will multiply in the end. When we try to make sense of things on our own power, we're brought to the end of ourselves. We begin to think that everything is meaningless until it's understood in the presence of God. The wicked owe their existence and their prosperity to the forbearance of God. And Asaph compares that forbearance to a dream. Just like, just like when you wake up and the dream that you're having vanishes and you can't remember it, so will it be with the wicked when God judges them. In verses 21 and 22, Asaph gives a summary of his spiritual condition when he was in turmoil over the wicked. He describes his soul as embittered, his heart as pricked. Have you ever been so troubled that you feel it in your gut? Asaph describes this, this mental quandary, this, this mismatch between what Scripture says about what the wicked and what his own perception of the wicked actually is. And here, he speaks of this mental struggle, and it has a deep emotional impact on him. His heart was being antagonized. He's like, like, likely it's tempting him to disbelief. His mind, his, his emotions, his desires, they're pierced. And his attitude was affected. He was sick, of, sick to his stomach over the seeming prosperity of the wicked. His self-deception, or sorry, his self-description in verse 21 is followed by his self-assessment in verse 22. Where he says that, that he was in a state, when he was in this state of doubt... He was like an ignorant beast before God. No comprehension, no spiritual sensitivity, no relational connection, like an untamed animal. Have you ever understood your own brokenness to say things like verse 21 and 22? It is good to tell God these things, and you should. It's good to tell God your own brokenness. It doesn't surprise him. He already knows it. Rest in him. Tell him how you feel and what you're thinking. And rest in the gentle and caring hands of God. Asaph's mind changes in verse 23 now that he has God's perspective on things. Now that he's certain that the wicked will ultimately not prosper, 
but will be destroyed quickly. Asaph meditates on his own relationship with God. And let's look now at the second certainty presented in this passage. God will prosper his own. God will prosper his own. Asaph's admission of this of his beast-like character serves as this transition between the two sections of text. Verses 1 through 20, Asaph observes the worldliness of the wicked and their end. He admits that he was wrong, and then in verse 23, he picks up with, Nevertheless, I am continually with you. Despite Asaph's brutishness and ignorance of divine matters, God still held his right hand. Notice, notice who left in times of darkness. It wasn't God. It was Asaph. God is not the one who is distant. And, and in fact, it is when we think that God is distant that he is closest to us. He draws near to us and he holds us in his hand. And God is always there. And we can always run to him, even when it feels like he's distant. God guides Asaph with wisdom. God is the one who who gives insight and instruction. And he does so through his word. The scriptures and the presence of God through prayer are what gives Asaph the insights and the wisdom he needs. And then look at this hope that he has or that he has after he says, the Lord guides him with his counsel. In verse 24, you guide me with your counsel, and afterward you will receive me to glory. Asaph is no longer looking at his present condition. He's no longer looking at his troubles. He's not looking at the world anymore. He's looking at God. He's looking to heaven. We can certainly put up with the present when we have a much clearer clearer vision of what's to come. Brothers and sisters, we look forward to a world where sin, sorrow, sickness, suffering, pain, death are no more. We look forward to a place where we will gaze upon Christ for all of eternity. And it is to this hope that we as Christians look forward to. But if you're here this morning, and you're not a Christian, I wonder, what hope do you have to look forward to? The weekend? Paycheck? Vacation? Retirement? Maybe you've got all of that, and you're you're excited about just living a life of leisure, where you can pursue your hobbies and just relax. But what after that? Do you have any hope after death? The hope that Christians have is that we will be with Christ for all of eternity. And this can be your hope too. All you have to do is trust in Christ alone for the forgiveness of your sins. You see, we have all sinned and lived lives like the wicked in verses 4 through 12 that we see. And in doing so, we deserve the quick and righteous judgment of God. Yet God, in love, chose to be merciful to us. He sent his son, Jesus, to become a man, to live a perfect life, and die the death that we deserve. On the cross, Jesus suffered the full measure of the wrath of God and was buried. And on the third day, he rose from the dead, defeating death in the grave. And if you you will trust in Jesus and in this gospel, you can experience this, this future hope of being received into glory, just like Asaph. After this, this hopeful realization from Asaph, he continues with these beautiful words. Look at verse 25. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is nothing on earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Asaph 
turns away from the glitter of the world to gaze at the gold that is God. For Asaph, God is, is better than all the riches of the world. It's like, it's like Jesus teaching in John 6. Jesus, in that passage, is explaining how people come to himself. And, and many people turned back and they, they went away, they walked away from him. And Jesus looks at his disciples and he said, are you going to walk away too? And what does Peter say? Where else should we go, Lord? You alone have the words of eternal life. In Christ alone are found the depth, the vastness, the, the grand sum of, of all the riches this world has to offer, and infinitely more. The things of this world will, will pass away just like the wicked, but God will prosper his own because he unites them to himself, and God is everlasting. Our hearts abide in the one who abides forever. There's, there's nothing desirable in this world other than God. Our flesh fails. Our hearts fail, just like Asaph. But God upholds us with his righteous right hand. God is the one who cares for us and who keeps us from stumbling. And in verse 26, Asaph says that God is his portion. What does it mean that God is our portion? The believer's portion, or their inheritance, or reward, their treasure and desire, is the Lord himself. God has given the greatest possible gift he could have given you. And it's himself. God forgives us, which is a great gift... But the forgiveness is so that he can give us himself. When Asaph says that God is his portion, he means that, that God is his everything. He has all that he needs because he has God. Brothers and sisters, are you content because you have God? Paul, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 8-10, through 10, says that we, as Christians, are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet well-known, as dying and behold we live, as punished yet not killed, as sorrowful yet always rejoicing, as poor yet making many rich, as having nothing yet possessing everything. If you are a Christian, you have Christ. What more could you need? Be content with Christ, the one who is the sustainer of the universe, who upholds everything by the word of his power, who reigns at the right hand of the Father, and who is coming again to defeat sin and death once and for all. Asaph finishes the psalm by summarizing what he has said and then offering a conclusion. In verses 27 and 28, he says, Those who are far from you shall perish, and you put an end to everyone who is unfaithful to you. But as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell of all your works. The wicked God will put an end to. God will destroy those who make a continual habit of living in sin. Yet God is also a merciful, merciful refuge for those who trust in him. Verse 28, Asaph says, But as for me, notice the difference between verse 2 and verse 28, where we've come so far. Verse 2, Asaph says, But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled, my steps had nearly slipped because he'd taken his eyes off God. Now in verse 28, he has his eyes back on God, back where they're supposed to be. And he says, he's, gone, he's made this complete 180 turn. He's gone from slipping and stumbling to saying the opposite. He says that it's good to be near God. But as for me, it's good to be near God. 
I have made the Lord God my refuge, that I may tell all your works. Had Asaph done this at the beginning, he would not have immersed himself in the afflictions of comparison and envy. The closer that we are to God, the less affected we are by the attractions and distractions this world has to offer. Asaph believes, trusts in God, and declares his works, even in this psalm. The one who is ready to believe the goodness of God will always see fresh goodness to believe in. And the one who is willing to declare the works of God will never be silent for the lack of wonders to declare. It may be good to enjoy the pleasures of the flesh. It may be good to enjoy the pleasures of the mind. But these are just uncertainties that are fading away like a breath on a cold day. According to Scripture and to Asaph, after he wrestles with it all and he thinks about it all, he says, you can be certain that it is good to be near God. So be near to him today. Let's pray. Our gracious Father, we praise you that, that you are faithful, that you are the God who remains steadfast and firm even when we stumble or slip. You hold on to us and our, our vision for all our days. Would you help us draw near to you? Help us be full of wisdom that comes from above and that is found in your word. We thank you for all the vast riches that you have lavished upon us in Christ. It's in, it's in his precious and holy name that we pray. Amen.